This is a deep dive into the promise and the pitfalls of Web3 with Jordan Hall. So Jordan is a tech entrepreneur who saw the waves of innovation of Web1 and Web2 up close and is now deeply invested in Web3, which he says is one of the only possible solutions to some of the biggest problems we're facing. Humanity is currently faced with an extremely heavy weight that needs to be lifted. It needs to be moved, maybe a significant distance. And the, my, my sense of things is, is twofold. One is that nothing in the current system and nothing in the current toolkit that we use to build systems can lift that weight. And two, to be perfectly frank, a substantial fraction of that weight actually is the current system. From my point of view, the Web3 fits in that transitionary space very precisely. Um, and suffice it to say, this is not an easy thing. This is an enormously daunting task. And in my experience, and I've looked at this for decades, there isn't anything on the horizon, at least in the context of the, of the exterior, in the context of the uh, interaction with the world, that comes vaguely close to having the possibility of achieving that level of strength and care and precision. So Web1 was the early pioneers, the utopians and garage innovators who created the early internet. Web2 was when the big giant monopolies moved in and colonized cyberspace. And Web3 is the name for the new wave of innovation, largely based on inventions like blockchain, and decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs, that believers say will revolutionize the world. But it's fair to say the space is a mix of utopian claims, massive hype, and speculation, and is also experiencing its own growing pains. Who would have thought that the that DAOs would have, the primary problem that DAOs would have is the problem of decentralized, decentralized coordination. A whole bunch of people pulling in different directions, fighting with each other. And I think he was being somewhat ironic, but the point is that's where, where we are, right? DAOs are actually beginning to emerge as a super real thing and are beginning to discover the limitations of our competence on the interior side. It's almost like been a blind spot, right? For the first almost decade of the, uh, the blockchain thing, there's almost a religious commitment to not giving a fuck about human beings, right? The whole point was we're going to work on incentive landscapes. We're going to work on technical architectures where prisoners' dilemma and defection problems are exited out on the basis of a exterior orientation, meaning we're going to create game-theoretic dynamics such that at a purely rational level, I don't care if it's a human being, what the human being on the other side is like. I don't need to worry about it at all. And right? that was almost like the, the, the spiritual center of the Byzantine general problem is, hey, human beings are difficult to figure out. Can't trust them. I need to build a system where I can trust the result, even though I don't necessarily trust any of the people. Mm. Dow space, I think, is not going to be able to resolve that. I can, I, can, I can deal with and use the resolutions to the Byzantine general problem between and among DAOs. But in the inside, I got people. Right? I got real life people. And that, I think, is the challenge. I don't think. That's the challenge. And that's the challenge that that part of the environment is facing right now. So given that the whole premise of Web3 is that it's more decentralized and more democratic, we're going to host a more open conversation next week. Jordan is going to come back to be in dialogue with a few different people, and we'll have the opportunity for questions and interactions. So if you'd like to join us, check the show notes below and find out how to register, and hope to see you there. Jordan, welcome back. Yeah, thank you, David. It's been a while. What do you think is the most important place to start for assuming people are coming in fairly new to the concept? Well, in my mind, the, I kind of think of it as maybe a three-step process. Um, one step would be to frame the, the meaningfulness of it. Like in some sense, why? What, what's, what's, the, what's the point that makes it something you might want to consider deeply, right? Not just... Um, superficially. Uh, then the second piece that shows up is, okay, what is it? What exactly are we even talking about? Um, can we, can we grasp this in a way that contextualizes so we can actually get a sense of something and not just a, uh, kind of a bag of stuff that we put a label on. Um, and then the third, I think, which is maybe what brought, brought us together in this conversation is say, okay, um, what's like, what's, what's wrong or what are the challenges? Maybe is the better way of putting it. Given what it is 
and why it's meaningful. <clears throat> what are the things that might be the most useful and relevant in terms of um, orienting those who are, are attending to it in a direction that would be um, sort of most supportive of it, realizing its meaningfulness um, best. And, and by the way, avoiding maybe some of the more dangerous pitfalls of which there are many. Hmm. Yeah, that, that feels like a good summary of, of what we've discussed so far before the conversation. Um, and yeah, I, I, I like your, from when, when I first came across your work, I think it was the situational assessment of 2017, you had this ability to kind of look at the minutiae of kind of what's going on, but also place it in this kind of grand sweep. So I think maybe let's start with the kind of grand sweep of Web3 and then maybe go into the minutiae and maybe some of the kind of moral dilemmas or ethical issues that the whole scene is kind of wrestling with or are coming up <clears throat> around it. Sounds good. And, and maybe what we can do is if it feels like it makes sense to drill down into lower levels of, of particulars at any given moment, just you know, double well, click. I, I can double click if I want. Is that the... Exactly. Yeah, it's like a giant... Um, uh, funny, like a virtual HTML. So just to maybe provide a little context and background, you mentioned um, you know, part of the reason why uh, we're having this call is I can't avoid having a conversation about this. You know, I don't particularly like speaking in public, um, but I have, I have a, a uniquely significant perspective on this kind of question. Um, in many ways, it's been kind of the through line of my my life. Like since the late seventies, I was engaged, hands on, you know, pulling apart computers, dealing with the uh, the interiors of you know flashing BIOS and stuff like that, and very detailed with <clears throat> what you might call the pre web, the early modem days and the uh, uh, ISP days and things like that, and then very particularly involved in Web One intimately involved in Web2, and now have chosen over the past decade to be involved all the way at the ground level in all the different emergent properties of Web3. Um, and with a particular perspective that tends to also bring in things like large-scale theory, right? So not just at the level of doing it, but also the level of contemplating what's happening and how does it fit in the larger context. So, um, so uh, uh, I'm obviously coming from a very particular perspective, and you know, we'll, we'll just provide that, and then we'll see if hopefully it's helpful. Is it worth double clicking on why Web3? What is Web1, what Web2, and what is Web3? I think, I think I'll get there in, 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 uh, in a moment. So just to put it, just the first part, to kind of put the whole thing in context and why I think it's meaningful, not just because it's sort of lots of money is flying around and people are talking, but... As you know, right, my, my frame, the frame that I'm operating under continuously is, is the one that was for the moment say there's a meta crisis. So there's some very big, significant thing going on in the world. And the way I would put it, maybe to make the metaphor very simple, is it's like we're, we're faced, humanity is currently faced with an extremely heavy weight that needs to be lifted. It needs to be moved, maybe a significant distance. And the my, my sense of things is, is twofold. One is that nothing in the current system and nothing in the current toolkit that we use to build systems can lift that weight. And two, to be perfectly frank, a substantial fraction of that weight actually is the current system. And right? so asking it to lift and move itself is a, a bit of a paradox. So we're faced with a real challenge of how do we not using the current system um, generate something that has the capacity to, to lift this enormous weight. And, and by the way, just to kind of make the metaphor a little bit tricky, you can imagine it being both heavy and also very fragile. So we have to lift it, but lift it with enough sort of sensitivity and care that we don't disrupt the world that, it, that it's holding uh, and then migrate to a more stable place. And I've, I've in the past talked about this as game A, game B, and then transition between the two. And, from my point of view, the Web3 fits in that transitionary space very precisely. Um, and suffice it to say, this is not an easy thing. This is an enormously daunting task. And in my experience, and I've looked at this for decades, there isn't anything on the horizon, at least in the context of the, of the exterior, in the context of the, 
interaction with the world that comes vaguely close to having the possibility of achieving that level of strength and care and precision than Web3. Right? So to me, this feels like this is the thing. And this is our, the thing we have to work with to solve the problem in front of us. Okay, so now how do we help it become the thing that it could be? Yeah. So that's how I'd position the notion of the meaningfulness. What, what are we talking about in terms of why? So now let's talk about in terms of, of what. What is it? What are, what are we actually talking about? And I, and I think that the name Web3 is particularly nice um, because it situates it in an arc. Right? It's not just blockchain. Certainly not just cryptocurrency. Um, you have this other term floating about metaverse, and right? it's, it's not just that, or perhaps maybe it is just that, but that requires that question to be investigated thoroughly. Um, so we have this notion of Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, and right? we're talking about a, a long arc. What I would say is that the, the, right, the proper way of understanding it is uh, Andreessen coined the term software is eating the world. And I'd say that's a nice vernacular way of talking about the relationship between this particular, very foundational, novel technology, digital, in relationship with the human-built world, and therefore also the natural world in the way that humans interface with the natural world. And <clears throat> on a theoretical level, these kinds of interfaces tend to operate from the outside in. You can sort of imagine it as... a uh, like almost like two two suns beginning to come into each other's orbit. And obviously the outer portion of one sun is what's going to interface with the gravitational field of the other sun as they start coming into orbit. Uh, practically speaking, in the context of software eating the world, the more peripheral things, the more superficial things like uh, you know flea markets and yellow pages um, were the first things to be impacted by and metabolized, eaten by software. Uh, earlier things too, like word processors, right? Remember that day when typewriters became word processors and then they became computers? That's the, that's the thing, right? And it's actually more complex than such a simple metaphor. Um, uh, the uh, kind of a rhizomatic or root structure is the right visual metaphor because certain kinds of things have particular affordances, which causes them to become more uh, early and fully and easily embraced by or metabolized by the digital. Uh, but other things which may actually be operating at the same level um, are more resistant. So, for example, in my personal life experience, uh, music, which became meaningfully touched by the digital in the late 90s in the context of the MP3 <laughs> revolution, is what we called it. At a physical level, the digitization of music was extremely affordant. Like it was quite easy by the time you got to the late 90s to take advantage of the ability of taking a song, which had already been rendered into digital by means of the transition from analog tape to, to CD, um, and convert it into a, a more portable, uh, purely digital form in the form of, of, of MP3, liberate it from the physical substrate of the disc. And also the development of the bandwidth and the connectivity of dial-up modems at 56K, which was present at that time, and the number and kind of humans who are interacting with each other by means of that earliest, earliest version of the internet uh, began to pull music rapidly, right? And if you recall those moments of time, like the movement from the introduction of MP3 to the introduction of Napster and the enormity of the consciousness of that, like it hit culture to the point where it actually burst all the way through to... Um, you know, moms and dads were were finding themselves interacting with MP3s, and it was on the on the news. So, from that direction, it was quite quite affordant to the attractive pull of digital, but it was also very tightly bound to the legal and political infrastructure of of the world, which was at that time quite uh, resistant to the pull of the digital. Right? So you actually had these two forces and precisely as music began the process of being completely evaporated into the digital, roughly 1999, the legal and political piece grabbed hold and pulled back quite hard actually. And <clears throat> so that's the notion of kind of moving from the exterior into the periphery and in the, in the core of a socio-technical system, at right? the core of, a, of the, the kind of the stuff that humans produce to manage themselves in the world are things like, or particularly in our current one, are things like money, finance, law, governance, um, you know, those kinds of institutional frameworks, science. 
i.e. how do we collaboratively discover what is true about the world. <clears throat> and the point of Web3 is to say, okay, now the sort of the event horizon of that, of digital, of software in the world has now crossed that threshold. And Web3 has already entered into, and in many ways has already metabolized things like money and finance. You know, DeFi stands quite poised toe-to-toe -to -toe with TradFi, at least in terms of complexity of offering and uh, certainly vastly more so in terms of rate of innovation. And we can speak about that, like the dynamics of how these things interrelate and how, what are the variables that matter. Um, and then it's now beginning to explore earnestly, right? Not just in terms of seeing it on the horizon, but actually now practically having to deal with the problematics of things like law and governance and frankly, also religion, which I've talked about NFTs as being really about that which is a whole rabbit hole. We'll have to but that's the core of the core. Right? There's not a whole lot, if you'd like. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and, and that set of, that set of things is, is, is the center. Right? There's, there's not really much left um, at the sociological level. Right? We're not talking about the fundamentally deep, actually human indigenous stuff like family. Um, so, so here we are. Right? We're at the point where the, the story of the, the emergence of the digital and the transition of the old world into the new world is now reaching its pivot point. And, and over the next few years, as Web3 uh, solves or addresses these core problems of, of, of things like governance and religion and law, um, it will begin in just exactly the same way as digital has, in fact, disrupted all the other things before it in due time and in the time that it took <clears throat> to do so at these core levels. And then the energy that has been bound, you know, the human attention, the, the aspects of the world, the, the ways that we cybernetically go about uh, managing uh, nature, physicality, will shift into this new environment. Right? So that's what I would say is what Web3 is. It is the... Uh, simultaneously the most contemporary, the current manifestation of the long arc of the digital, uh, but also happens to be uh, at the moment where <clears throat> the pivot point between the old and the new uh, will almost certainly occur. I think it might be good to just double click on what is the nature of Web 3 versus the nature of Web 2, because I think that's a good kind of comparison. People talk about Web 3 as being essentially decentralized, whereas Web 2 was enabling these vast kind of monopolies in these different areas. Is Web3 by its nature a more democratic, more decentralized model? Or could it also be co-opted in the same way? All right, so to, addre to address this question actually requires a, a pretty high level of abstraction, to be honest. Like if we, if we settle on artifacts, then we might feel like we've resolved the question because it has a feeling of rightness and simplicity, but it's not actually going to get us very far, <clears throat> which is to say we'll discover that we were wrong. Um, it's something like this. Web 2 was operating in the frame of um, the political economy of the legacy world. That's, that's the most important piece about Web, web 2 meaning that Web2 perceived itself as a function of capitalism. And it was, a, it was a, a thing that was being done at the level of the economy and in the, in the milieu of offering goods and services in the marketplace. And this creates all kinds of interesting consequences. Like think about the nature of how Facebook shows up in the world. You know, Twitter. Hey, just, we're, we're just, a, we're just a, a, a company just offering a, a product and a service into the marketplace. Like, geez, you know, we didn't know that we were going to be disrupting the entire political system and, and causing human brains to reboot. Like, wow. And by the way, not our problem. Like, that's not how you deal with that sort of thing. Government, take care of that problem. Yeah. Uh, Web3 is not. Web3 may not yet have fully realized the degree to which it's actually operating in a peerage with those those frames at that level. It's actually operating fundamentally at the level of governance, fundamentally operating at the level of law and at the level of religion, which is profound by, you know, enormously. Okay. So that's, that's what I would say. That's the actual fundamental difference. And what I mean by that is, you know, I was, you know, I was there in web two. 
I was actually physically working on things like digital currencies and stuff like that. And the awareness of the possibility space of where digital could go and how we might go about designing it. It's not like we weren't thinking about decentralization back in the late 90s and early 2000s. I mean, we had stuff like, like BitTorrent, which was profoundly decentralized and, and, and very effectively so. Uh, and other like, structures that were even more decentralized, like Nutella, I believe is what it's called. The conceptions were there. Um, open source software was there, like all the, all the basic frameworks, but the ability to manifest them in reality in the context of what was available in terms of our capacity to do in relationship with the operating environment that we were in, but also the ability to actually think them clearly, given the state of where our mindset was, um, wasn't available, right? So it was sort of a, a manifestation of a particular potentiality in an event in, environment that showed up in a particular way, you know? Um, and this is like, it's hard to really, I think, grasp this unless you've just been doing it, but it's, um, you come with a, a deep aspiration and vision, right? You have a sense of what's possible, but then you have to manifest it. And so the manifestation of it has to explore the actual physical reality that you're dealing with. So you could imagine somebody like, uh, you know, uh, oh, let's go with Bezos. Bezos is a really nice example, right? It's entirely possible that where Amazon is now, like Amazon Web Services and the whole universe of Amazon was completely present in his most subtle vision way back when it was just a fucking bookseller. Yeah? But to make it legible and to make it practical, it had to enter into the world as just a fucking bookseller. Right? So from Bezos' perspective, he's like, what are you talking about? Amazon has always been precisely what it is now and what it shall become. You know, we don't even haven't seen it yet. But if we look at it sort of in the linear arc of, it, of its manifestation in reality, in, in our physical environment, there's a, a path that it takes. So my sense is it's actually more like that. Um, now, what does that mean practically? So practically, if we're thinking about like scaling a mountain, the, the location of blockchain, meaning both the strength of the innovation, like the profundity of the innovation, the amount of power that it actually represents and what it can do, and its position precisely in the heart of money and finance, which is, like it or not, the absolute uh, what do you call it, most vital organ of the, of the old environment that we were, we've been operating in, um, establishes the movement across the threshold. Right? So what could be in the context of Web 2, once, once Bitcoin, right, once Bitcoin emerged and passed a certain threshold of realization, it enabled the entire universe to shift into this strata, which then, of course, means at a technical level, you're going to be operating on top of that platform, like in much the same way that, say, Web 1 was sitting on top of TCP, IP, HTML, and the possibility space that was secured by that, uh, also, by the way, Ethernet. Um, Web 3 has as its sort of foundational basis the underlying implications of what blockchain enables as a, as a, as a location. Um, and we can, by the way, talk about that a lot too, because certainly engineers are continue to scratch their head as to why the fuck are we using this weird way of solving basic database problems as a substrate for building, uh, which is a whole, that, that's a very deep and quite useful rabbit hole. But that's a, what I would say is that at a mindset level, right, at the level of like, what's the cultural basis, right? Because a thing becomes what the people who are building it believe is appropriate and real and what's available in the environment that it's operating in. You know, so both the interior and the exterior matter. Um, at that level, the mindset of Web3 is profoundly decentralized. Right? It was weaned on the underlying cultural perspective of blockchain initially. And as it brought more and more people in from different environments, one of the, um, you know, the cultural biases, like almost like, you got to swear by these five things if you want to play this game. You, you wouldn't even, it wouldn't make sense to you, you wouldn't participate, and your considerations would be rejected by the people who are already here, would be an orientation towards decentralization. Which, by the way, has, you know, constantly gone through a process of struggle. The, the question of decentralization as a religious faith, the notion of decentralization as a design bias, the question of, of decentralization in the context of centralization and, and decentralization as design characteristics appropriate to different kinds of, you know, um, problem spaces. You know, that's that all that is still happening constantly. Um, let me see. 
Oh, here's another one. Really important, actually. It's not Silicon Valley. So Web 2 was Silicon Valley, like even to the point where things like Facebook got acquired and moved physically <laughs> to Silicon Valley. Um, and that implies a lot. Right? It implies the, the humans who happen to dominate that particular environment. It implies the aesthetics, <laughs> like the, the kinds of sweater vests that you wear and the, the kind of the little checkered shirt that the Silicon Valley types wore around, the haircuts, the facial expressions, the tones. The, uh, the Overton windows of what was available discourse and the uh, bias towards venture capital uh, values pilloried in, uh, what was that movie? I think it's, the show was called Silicon Valley. Mm. Never watched it, but I get the sense of it. Uh, Web3 is not. Web3 is not Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, of course, is endeavoring to sink its kind of claws into it and, it, and it may succeed to some extent. But because Web3 actually included a way of, of bootstrapping its own finance by means of its magic internet money, uh, and because it was super not obviously part of the stuff that, Web, that Silicon Valley was investing in at in the, in the sort of 2010 to 2017 timeframe. Uh, what I mean by that is even to have proposed participating in blockchain and cryptocurrency, which of, in fact I was doing back in that time frame, was perceived as uh, kind of unclean and uncouth by your mm. Silicon Valley luminaries. You really wanted to invest in Snapchat. Um, it built its own approach. And it's intrinsically global. You know, Web3 is as Indian and as African and as Asian as, as it is West Coast, maybe even more so. Right? Places like Israel uh, and Switzerland played a profound role in its early stages. Um, it's intrinsically already sitting on top of the internet. Right? To collaborate in Web3 is in fact to collaborate by means of something like Discord or Twitter, not by means of an office. You want to talk about remote work? It's always been. There, there are some, of course, things that are part of the Web3 ecosystem that are, in fact, traditional corporations that sit in places. And, and there's plenty, but not the essence, not the centerpiece. And um, that's actually quite important. Are there any... Um, I mean, people are very familiar with Web2. So you can name Facebook, you can name Google, you can name all of these Twitter, all of these projects. Are there Web3 to make it real for people, are there Web3 products that people are familiar with or projects that people are familiar with, or is it all still nascent? I mean, Bitcoin is well, an I, example of one that people will have heard of, I guess. I don't know what people have heard of, I'm afraid. I don't, I'm definitely not people. Um, Ethereum is a really nice example of something that is quite Web3. Um, Bitcoin is profoundly Web3 in particular ways, but it also includes a lot of stuff that was kind of... Uh, in the childhood stage. So if you sort of map Bitcoin as pure Web3, that's a little bit like mapping the Bay Area Computer Club as the essence of personal computers, which, you know, yeah, a little bit and also a whole lot not. Um, let's see, what, were, what are other things that have a nice... Well, I don't know if, if people are aware of things like, say, CryptoPunks and, uh, and, and the Bored Apes Yacht Club, but that's super Web3. Um, or another one, something like, say, uh, uh, let's go with uh, PancakeSwap um, or any of the sort of the big DeFi platforms, also very Web3, like much more to the center of it than the earlier ones, but the simple nature of having, having gone through a couple of generations to uh, be less bound to older inertia. Hmm. And by the way, here's the fun part. If you're not at all familiar with that, I would recommend that you become familiar. Mm. And so I spoke to my friend and former Rebel Wisdom guest, Rich Bartlett, about it. He put out this amazing newsletter that I'll put a link down in the in the show notes. And he his one of the one of the uh, paragraphs from his piece was, according to his proponents, Web three is going to save us from the evils of Web two: mass surveillance, extractive economics, propaganda, misinformation, etc. To its detractors, it's the greatest speculative bubble in history and an obscene waste of energy. I think it could be both. What I found is a lot of uncorroborated hype, get-rich-quick mythology and naive, naive utopianism. And I've also found some of the boldest innovations in cooperative ownership and governance that I've ever seen. Would you agree with that? Because at the moment, like, there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of um, excitement there's a lot of utopian thinking but there's also like whenever i hear that i also get a sort of skeptical response kick in almost immediately as well 
Well, the, that was quite complex. I, I, I wonder what the skeptical response would be orienting towards. Um, well, my so let's skeptical see. response, I, I guess, is, is it seems too good to be true. Therefore, it probably is. Ah, right. Well, if you take the, the negative part of what he described, which was sort of at least half, that would also be maybe too bad to be true. So there we go. Hmm. Um, so let me kind of, first of all, I'll, I'll make something quite simple. Uh, you, you, you heard my life arc, my background, and I am extremely staked in Web3. And so according to the pattern recognition that I have, having watched many times, like 10 or 12 times, different things emerge into the world, always having the same sensibility of what the fuck is that? It's probably stupid or bad, maybe even a little bit unclean, um, probably fake in some particular way, or holy shit, it's going to save the world. My God, it's the best thing ever. I mean, I was aware of this. We had the same conversations back in the early Web 1 days, for sure. Um, I'm sure that the guys in early Apple felt felt very evangelical about what they were doing um, uh, then as well. And, you know, my personal sort of both attention and resources are highly staked in Web 3. All right. So I am not all in, but pretty close. All right. So that's a very, what do you call it? Uh, what's the right, the, the caveat? Um, I am, in fact, an investor. So let's see. There's so much that has to be actually teased apart to, to, to speak clearly. Let's take just like the term speculation. All right. By the way, just at a meta level. We really need to learn how to speak clearly as a species. <laughs> like the degree to which we engage in ordinary hominid social grooming, which is really all we're almost always doing when we speak. And like what we're really, we're using words. We're, we're, we're you know, throwing words around. But all we're really doing is saying, hey, are we kind of like friendly with each other? Can we maybe like take bugs off of each other and not kill each other? Um, as opposed to communicating and finding a way to collectively perceive reality is uh, – is a challenge. All right, so let's take the word or the notion speculation. Because like many things, it actually has two distinct valences. All right. uh, one valence has to do with the, the gap between possibility and actuality. You know, let's say I've got a, I've met uh, a girl for the very first time. And it, it seems like there's something that could happen here. And I choose to invest my precious life, time, energy in building that relationship on the basis of the sensed possibility. That's speculation. I sense a possibility and then I invest my precious life, time, energy, and attention in seeing whether or not, and by the way, building the directionality of that towards the felt sense of possibility. And oftentimes the Possibility does not actualize at the level that was perhaps initially sensed. Okay. That happens in speculation. Almost nothing meaningful has ever occurred that was not first and foremost the subject of profound speculation. Do anything that matters at all. And that's what you're doing, right? You write a book. You, know, you, um, you know, create a song. You feel it first in this vague, profound, powerful possibility. And then if it motivates you and moves you to do so, you invest your skillfulness and perhaps the energy of the people around you in trying to manifest what it is you perceive as possible into reality. And oftentimes you fail. Okay. That's one side of it. It's crucial. And there's another side of it. The other side is it's very easy to trade on that. It's very easy to parasitize the gap between the actual and the possible. Right? Simulation works very well in that space. And the, the felt sense of what do the signals mean? How do I know whether or not this thing is possible? How do I know whether or not it's proceeding towards the possibility that it could be? Well, there's a whole category of people who do a very good job of, of thriving on precisely that. They're called confidence men, right? Confidence is not intrinsically a negative thing. But preying on the fundamental human necessity of confidence is. And when anything new emerges, particularly when the potency is very large, it intrinsically attracts a very large amount of people. Right? Some small fraction you might think of as being the artists of the scene. Now I'm going to shift into senior's language, by the way. The artists of the scene are well, well uh, positioned to hear the call. 
Right? They, they can kind of perceive the subtlety of the possibility with some unique level of, of kind of clarity and precision and happen to have a unique competence and capacity to actualize it into reality with fidelity to what the scene is about, right? the, the artists of the scene. It also attracts a whole lot of people who can feel it but can't quite really enact, interact with it. Right? So they sort of they maybe mill about going, what's going on here? It's interesting. I don't know why. It's a little bit like a... Uh, you know, if you walk through a city, like London, like I remember walking through New York one time and I saw a very long line. Like my attention was big line must be important. And people were gathering at the line, having no idea what was on the other side of it, right? Where, where people gather, other people gather, which means there's a lot of energy. And where there's a lot of energy that doesn't know what's going on, there's a really good resource to be exploited. And so then it also gathers the vampires and parasites. And that's kind of unavoidable. Right? There's just very little capacity that we've been able to prove so far as humans to avoid the, uh, uh, those three kind of dynamics showing up in anything. And the more potent it is, the more that's going to happen. Now, unfortunately, and this, by the way, there's a whole really nice blog post. I think it may be Slate Star Codex or somebody proximal to that who has really nice words about like mops and sociopaths and shit like that. This speaks to this in a, in a sort of a more simplified and vernacular way. But, um, Unfortunately, the parasites know what they're about, which is that they are trading on the lack of clarity and producing a legible simulacra of the thing. Right? So the, the mass in the middle, who can't perceive it as clearly as the artists, aren't able to distinguish the real from the simulation. Um, therefore, they cannot effectively, consistently choose to orient their energy and attention towards the thing that's being produced by the artists and are therefore relatively reasonably hoodwinked by the, uh, by the parasites. Um, and the artists are artists, right? They're not warriors. Um, their intrinsic orientation is towards doing everything they can to focus on this crazy thing and trying to bring it forth into the world with fidelity and clarity. Oh shit, there's a parasite chewing in my head right now. Well, you know, that's just what's going to happen. That's not their gig. Um, and for whatever reason, we don't seem to have done a very good job of really thinking about how do you actually always bring warriors, like, with <laughs> with the artists, right? If you did that, we maybe could do this job better. So here we are, right? And if, if, if my proposition is correct, which is that we're talking about something which in potential has an order of magnitude of capacity, which is maybe equal to the to, to this heaviness of what we actually need to do, then it's not at all surprising that it has also shown up as quite a shit show. All right, so be it. Um, you know, once you're not surprised by the natural development of these kinds of things, and you know, pick your poison. Like look at uh, the punk scene or the new wave scene, and you know, the club scene. You may be familiar with the Manchester scene. I mean, pick any scene, any time, particularly if you really cared about it and you watched it kind of get jacked and corroded and, and hijacked and also producing a tremendous things of beauty, right? I would say, however, this kind of bridges us to the point of what needs to happen, <laughs> but we can get there in, in when we want to, when the time happens. Mm. The, the, yeah. What do you, what do you mean that needs to happen? Well, um, web three as it currently sits is, how would I say? on the edge of a blade, it could fall towards the good. It might not. In fact, it could fall to the very bad, like super bad, actually worse, much worse, tremendously worse, like incomprehensibly worse. Um, and so the walking that narrow path and trying to find out how do we nudge it, and we now, I don't mean like you and me, I mean we, towards the good um, is say how I say sort of the, the appropriate thing. Mm. Yeah, let me let me bring something in right now that hasn't actually been part of this part of the conversation, but I think it is quite important. I mentioned metaverse, and let me also then mention AI. If, if I were to sort of sit in front of a panel of people who've thought deeply about the problem space and said, "Look, guys, you know, we're we're kind of heading towards a cliff. The meta crisis is big and getting bigger, and obviously." The folks who have been entrusted with stewarding and steering humanity are some terrible combination of incompetent and corrupt. So we can't rely on them to do shit. And they couldn't in any way. Right? They're, they're driving a 1957 Chevy and we're trying to go to the moon. All right. What could? And one of the hands that would come up would be AI. 
AI, in principle, also has the strength to do this thing, right? to, to lift that heavy weight. Um, let me see. But it's also got all kinds of trouble. AI is something that is uh, kind of like CRISPR, genetic engineering. Uh, don't fiddle with that. Right? Don't, don't, that's, a, uh, uh, we call it, that's a Hail Mary. <laughs> and we don't want to get in that context, right? So what I would say is something like part of the event horizon is of Web3 is it building the capacity to steward things like the metaverse and AI so that those don't um, destroy us all, which they have the potency and power and, frankly, proclivity to do so. Uh, as currently operated. I'm guessing, I mean, you talked about walking the blade. And when you're referring to AI, I mean, the the kind of visceral sense I get with it is that you're talking about AI being effectively kind of ethics free. It's an amazing tool, but there's no, there's no intrinsic ethic to it whatsoever. In fact, it's kind of, by, by definition, it has no moral sense. And I know that we've had this conversation and I've had this conversation with quite a few people around DAOs and Web3 and this sense that because it's been a gold rush so far ah. and a lot of people, that there's a sense that the, the expectation and the kind of sense of reward and maybe the gold rush and the sense of greed has massively outstripped its ethical sense and the sense of there needs to be some equivalent wisdom process that is equi equivalent to the capacity of Web3. Are those things linked? I've just linked quite a few things together there that maybe you might want to pull apart. Hmm. Well, in, in maybe in the context of showing, let's, let's slow down <laughs> and take the time. Mm -hmm. um, ethical sense. So I would say something like an embodied ethics, um, which of course then means both a uh, three things, an awareness of the fact that choices are meaningful and a commitment to take a level of responsibility commensurate with the magnitude of the choices that you're making. And then a capacity, a practice that has embodied your ability to actually take that responsibility, not just theoretically, but for real. And so that's what I would say. And in that case, I would say for sure, this is lacking. Um, for the most part, and by this I mean almost completely, uh, our technological horizon in general is dominated by what I would call unconscious process. Uh, Moloch is a name that has been, you know, used and designed in the space and represents nicely, aesthetically, uh, unconscious process. Um, things like the way the prisoner's dilemma operates is of that sort. And arms races happen in those kinds of environments. Uh, the notion of, well, if I don't build a hyper strategic bootstrapping AI, then my competitor will. So I must. Oh, but wait, if we go in that direction, then we're going to create something enormously hazardous and almost certainly going to create bad results. True, but you know, if I don't do it, he will. That's even worse. And you get trapped. So there's the both. What I'm saying is simultaneously, the if you aren't using conscious process, then you're using unconscious process. You're using process to search the possibility space. If you're not using conscious process, you're using unconscious process. The, the lack of conscious process at the level of awareness and then also at the level of capacity. I would say that's characteristic of our technical innovation field in general and particularly problematic in the context of things of magnitude like AI, CRISPR, and then metaverse, and then Web3. Yeah? Mm. And this is why Web3 is so interesting, because while it is dangerous, it is less dangerous than these other ones, but it could produce the kind of mm, control structure and could embody the kind of ethical capacity to properly govern the others. So 
This is something we didn't mention at the beginning. It kind of. You know, our, our heading to the, to, to the cliff is no longer a merely a sort of a one-dimensional vector. It, it actually has to do with the fact the road gets narrower and narrower. And on the left side is the existential risk of the tools that we are using to save ourselves are the ones that kill us. And on the right side is what, what I've called the catastrophic risk of our destabilization of the environment that we live in, all the different elements, the, the human environment, the natural environment, etc. And so what happens is that every step we take forward, we, we sort of up the ante in terms of the power of the technical tools that we're using to manage our life on Earth. But this actually increases the risk of the technical tools that we're using and, by the way, it tends to kick the can down the road in terms of the risk of our relationship with the natural environment, because we're not wise enough to, to not do that. So every sort of step we take forward, the road gets narrower and narrower, and the, the kind of the cliffs get steeper and steeper. So um, that's why I said, like we're driving 57 Chevy, what we need is a, an airplane or a rocket. We have to actually go <laughs> vertical because staying on the horizontal plane is not going to work. So this is, the again, pointing towards the possibility. It is my estimation that Web3 represents a possibility of a human-based collective intelligence that has the capacity, the amount of strength available to lift this heavy weight off the ground and begin to fly. One of the things I was thinking about in terms of the ethical framework is something that Rich put into his essay about potentially Web3 solving some of the coordination and um, alignment problems that we have with the current system. And I'll, I'll read something oh, yeah. here. Um, perhaps this new technology can help us solve some of the coordination failures that have us racing towards a grim future. Um, to invent a class of virtual institutes. So I guess he's saying that it could help deal with the prisoner's dilemma and the sort of the multipolar trap of creating feedback mechanisms, creating enforcement mechanisms that are decentralized that might solve some of the coordination problems that we currently have. Yeah. So let me, let me just quickly, I'm going to do a, 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 if I can hold it in a, a sort of an encyclopedic move on this, the coordination problems. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to dispense with most of them and just focus on that one, but it's nice to have them in, in context. Uh, one of the coordination problems that we have has to do with the way that uh, hierarchical systems have limitations. And so we have one solution to coordination, which is the notion of a hierarchical system, a bureaucracy, an institution, a corporation, things like that. And there are very specific limitations on how much capacity in terms of perception, sense-making, and agency they can actually produce. Right? So there's like a, they're really good for certain kinds of things, but really shitty for other kinds of things. In particular, as we've seen in the context of COVID, they're extraordinarily incapacitant in relating with complexity. It's not, that's not their native milieu, right? They, they must carve out a portion of reality into the complicated domain and operate in that complicated domain, which means they participate in the whole ball of problems that are, have to do with the complicated domains, right? So that's one. So that's a whole coordination thing. And there's a bunch of stuff there, like, okay, how do we all get on the same page? And how do we, you know, how do we share our insight, all that? It's a coordination problem, and that's one solution. On the other side, we have markets, for example. Right? And markets have a whole other set of problems, uh, not the least of which is this bias towards unconscious process. Right? So things like Moloch. And, okay, there seems to be a third. This is one of the things I wrote about many years ago, is that the solution to the Byzantine general's problem, this notion of being able to produce a, a kind of consensus of, of state, a consensus of what is, um, outside of either uh, the unconscious process of markets or the bureaucratic process, the institutional hierarchical process, it appears to, in fact, to actually just be novel. That's interesting. <sighs> Not interesting, it's profound. Now, um, what do I mean by that? Well, one thing I mean is decentralized organizations, in principle, have the capacity to produce a level of collective intelligence that isn't limited in the way that hierarchical bureaucratic organizations are. Right? You can include more people more fully and more uh, in a more integrated way 
both in terms of their perception, i.e. what do they perceive as being real and valuable, and in terms of their agency. How do they, how do they deploy their skillfulness and capacity in relationship to, right? So that's at the level of like, hmm, actuality, right? the capacity to do so. Yes, that is the case. And so when I said earlier, like all the way back in the very beginning, it has the potential capacity to lift this heavy weight at the cybernetic level, the amount of, of, of complexity, the amount of richness of experience and life and challenge that in principle could be perceived, processed and act, acted with at the level of like subtlety and nuance and detail um, to actually respond well to reality is available within the topology of these kinds of decentralized organizations. And the technologies of things like blockchain enable these decentralized organizations to mesh and to coordinate between and among each other in very fine grain levels. They can be small, they can be fast, they can be fluid. And think about this notion of how a DAO works. Right? The DAO is a, uh, an interiority, but the people who are participating in the DAO don't live in that interiority. Right? There's this really interesting new network graph where you live as a whole human in the world but your energy manifests into very particular projects and activities in a well-coordinated fashion. That's very different than in the disciplinary environment of the late 20th century in you know, a corporation where you, know, you sort of teleport between environments. You teleport from being at home, then you migrate through a commute into your corporation where you're now in the container and all of you, know, you have to be, right? Don't make any personal phone calls on company time and that kind of crap. Um, okay, but then you have the other, other side of the problem, right? the Moloch problem. And it's funny, maybe this is perfect time to sort of wrap up. Um, I mentioned that right before we got on this call, I chose to kind of run a, uh, uh, how would you say, synchronistic experiment. I pulled up Twitter, I spun the wheel, and I looked at what the first tweet was. And it was a person commenting on that, the, um, <laughs> who would have thought, I'm paraphrasing, but as best I can, who would have thought that the the DAOs would have, the primary problem that DAOs would have is the problem of decentralized, decentralized coordination. A whole bunch of people pulling in different directions, fighting with each other. And, and I think he was being somewhat ironic, but the point is that's where, where we are, right? DAOs are actually beginning to emerge as a super real thing and are beginning to discover the limitations of our competence on the interior side. And so at the level of the underlying technology of how do you actually create the kind of contracts and but contracts I hear mean smart contracts, technical software coordination, what do the entities look like? What are, what are some of the notions like how do the, how do the entities actually govern choices at the, at the kind of the X here, the mechanical level? Like, what does this look like? Still lots of work being done, but it's moving forward, right? And it's beginning to, to be effective. Like there's a, almost, it's almost an engineering problem. But in terms of the interior, how do human beings actually take care of the human part? Um, it's almost like been a blind spot, right? And for the first almost decade of the, uh, the blockchain thing, there's almost a religious commitment to not giving a fuck about human beings. Right? The whole point was we're going to work on incentive landscapes. And we're going to work on technical architectures where prisoners dilemma and defection problems are exited out on the basis of a exterior orientation meaning we're going to create game theoretic dynamics such that at a purely rational level, I don't care if it's a human being, what the human being on the other side is like. I don't need to worry about it at all. And right? that was almost like the, the, the spiritual center of the Byzantine general problem is, hey, human beings are difficult to figure out. Can't trust them. I need to build a system where I can trust the result, even though I don't necessarily trust any of the people. Mm. Dow space, I think, is not going to be able to resolve that. I can, I can, I can deal with and use the resolutions to the Byzantine general problem between and among Dows. But in the inside, I got people. Right? I got real life people, and that I think is the challenge. I don't think that's the challenge, and that's the challenge that that part of the environment is facing right now. So now let me let me double click on that, because as always, it has at least. He has a number of different aspects. One aspect is at the level of it's like skill and practice. And the metaphor I used in that tweet, I responded, uh, and I'll use here to see if it works. Um, in, in the, in the run-up to World War II, a bunch of new technologies had entered uh, the milieu of war, 
uh, perhaps most notably of which was radio. Because radio afforded a level, a quality, a capacity for coordination, which of course was quite distinct than what we saw in the pre-radio period. Just think about that. Like when you were using things like telegraph and pigeons and couriers to communicate, which is what it was like in World War I and previous, there were a whole bunch of things that you couldn't do when you could actually communicate in real time over distance, right? electromagnetically using radio. But people didn't know how to use it. Right? The doctrine, the habits, the ways to go about using radio to coordinate people to effectively wage war took time. Right? So that's one problem. There's a problem of just kind of like practicing in a milieu as we begin to build new concepts, um, find out what works, almost like the evolutionary process of the interior socio-technology of team. You know? And that's for sure part of it. The other part that I would propose, um, and always seems to be the case, is that the individual capacity, right? there's, there's actually going to be a need for receptor sites and competences in the interior of the individual, which allow the individual to participate in and perhaps produce and receive the signals and make sense of them coherently, quickly, and appropriately that are actually being produced in their environment. <laughs> and here I'd actually point somewhat humorously to the notion of vibes. You familiar with that term and the, and the meaning of it? Yeah. It actually seems to be very Gen Z in general. Like it's not a Web3 thing. Gen Z is vibing vibes all the time. But I'd like to valorize that term. I'd actually like to say, put it, put it into the foreground. In fact, I like to valorize the entire context and concept of the aesthetic. Even more so. Maybe crown. Crown the aesthetic, not just valorize. That, remember we talked about art and the artist. And what I'd say is that the proper way of being in relationship to what's happening in this milieu, into the domain or the scene of Web3, is the necessity of becoming artist on the part of effectively everyone. Well, one must actually learn how to build and attune their aesthetic sense, which is to say to attune their capacity to perceive quality, to feel richly and with clarity and subtlety, and then behave accordingly. Right? And this is, I think I've spoken about this in other contexts. Um, you know, how does a musician who is playing, not on sheet music, but playing in flow, know what the next note ought to be? Now, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a knowing. It's a knowing that has lots of moment to it. Because if you play the wrong note, it's, it's bad. In fact, in many ways, profane. And yet it's possible. It's possible to land just the right, just the right note that holds the whole song in continuity and brings with trying to manifest itself into the world cleanly. Kind of a weird way to manage an organization, right? That's what I'm saying. That's actually what has to happen. Like I'm telling you right now, Web3, you're going to have to become artists, all of you, in a deep sense. And as it turns out, the competence and capacity to navigate through the process of becoming moving from being engineers to being artists turns out to also invoke the capacity to then be stewards. Right? Un underneath or as a result of the capacity to become an artist, you then also develop the capacity to become a steward. And that the, the choice making that begins to emerge uh, at the individual and the group and the collective level will intrinsically begin to migrate towards the, what we would say, the ethical or, or that form of choice making, which is properly sovereign. So, uh, you know, a way of saying it is that Web3 must become truly sovereign, capital T, capital S, in the way that you know, we've spoken about it ourselves. And have you come across the argument that blockchain and Web3 is currently just, I mean, there's an interesting graph here saying innovators, early adopters, and that, that it hasn't yet crossed the, the chasm of early adopters. There's an interesting article where a guy was basically trying to put together a crypto wallet and buy an NFT and found so many blocks to, to, to the transition to the early adopters and the early majority. Have, do, you, do you get that argument that it's not yet at the, at ready for prime time? It's funny. So once again, it, the problem with it is that it's simplistic. The problem with it is that it assumes that there's in fact just one curve, but there's not. Right? There's, there's a very large number of curves that are superimposed on each other. Um, you know, so for example, for me as an individual, there's a curve. 
And there are some things to which I am that, that are my chasm. Now, as I cross a chasm, that doesn't necessarily mean that for you, you cross the chasm. Right? So we can step back and say, yeah, of course, simplistically, I can kind of integrate across the sort of the whole of humanity and think of it as being a single dimensional problem of have quote unquote enough arbitrary abstract people cross the chasm. You know, am I kind of there in kind of the bell curve of Homo sapiens? But this sort of more nuanced fractal level is important because it's it, it's kind of like the way that a being grows. We're talking more about like an organic development than we're talking about a um, kind of an abstract process. So a, a lot of people, millions, I think hundreds of millions of people, have crossed many chasms on this particular arc. Um, and, and, and the question that's really meaningful is where are we on the developmental arc? And so let me, let me sort of expand on our toolkit. On the one hand, we have a notion of, of, of where we are on this story of crossing the chasm, right? And what I've just said is, Hey, it's high dimensional. So let's take a look at it. But yeah, we're definitely not for like an abstract notion of homo sapiens across the entire human population, uh, across the chasm in that simple sense. But then we have something like, what's the area under the curve of the potential? How much has already been included in this? And now I can sort of think about everybody where they are. Everybody, you know, some people are way deep into Web3. Some people are only vaguely, vaguely aware of it. And some people don't even are aware of it at all, right? of course. So integrate that, integrate that whole totality. And what's the capacity? And how rapidly is that capacity upgrading its own capacity? And how does that relate to the shape of the hill that it's trying to climb? That's the question, right? My proposition is um, we're over the hump. My proposition is that the, the rate of innovation on the inside of what's happening in Web3 is, on the one hand, incomprehensible. I remember I've done this many times. Like I participated in many, many, many communities. The amount of innovation that's happening in Web3 the rate and the magnitude is off the charts. It's mind boggling. Like literally I've been boggled. <laughs> I've gone deep and down rabbit holes and, and actually physically found myself like some amount of time later going, Whoa, what just happened? Like I just literally became lost so much faster than web one, way faster than web one. Okay. Now let me think. It's almost like, uh, you know, think about these characters that we see in story, like uh, Sherlock Holmes in the, in the BBC show. Um, you know, sort of slightly distracted hyper geniuses. And you imagine that there's like somebody who's like tr puzzling with a Rubik's Cube. I don't know. Weird story. But let's just say there's like some reason why person A can't get off the couch and go do the thing until they've solved the Rubik's Cube. And then, you know, Sherlock Holmes really needs like, hey, we need to go and investigate this thing. And they look back and they say, what's troubling you? Like, why aren't you following me out the door? And they're like, well, I got to solve this Rubik's Cube. Sherlock Holmes tilts his head ever so slightly, looks at it, just fucking solves it and puts it to the side. And the whole, oh, I get it. Turns out it's actually not that hard a problem to solve when you're operating at IQ 53,000. Yeah, that's important. We're talking about massive problems that are being processed and solved like every 15 minutes in this space. It's crazy. And by the way, massive craziness, like nonsense that's being produced as well. Like we're, it's big magnitude. Um, and so things like how do you develop an onboarding methodology to navigate the UI difficulty to be able to get like, you know, 47 year old um, product managers on board, not massive problem, small problem, relatively speaking, trivial problem. And by the way, the kind of problem that was really a big problem during web two, which means one that we've actually built whole techniques around. There are people who are really good at that problem. Finally, let's just add the last piece. Remember the very beginning? You know, the world is on fire. <laughs> you know, reality has been doing a really great job of pushing people out of their dogmatic slumber and their places of comfort. And my hypothesis, of course, if true, is that that's going to continue to escalate. So, uh, you know, a lot of people got into the earliest phases of this thing because of the 2008 financial crisis and the 2010 in Europe. You know? If, if, uh, that hadn't remember the movie, uh, the big short, 
Remember that? Great movie. Remember in the end, they had this really nice ending where he's like, yeah, and, and they did. Like, they really, the lots of assholes were thrown in jail and, you know, regulations were changed. It was all better. And like, oh, wait, no, didn't happen at all. <laughs> like, nobody went to jail. And actually, everything got more brutal. Well, a lot of people took a moral lesson from that. In fact, the emergence of Bitcoin itself appears to have been produced by that. Like, if you look at that sort of little secret code that was put in the, in the block, it's, I think, the Times and a particular quote. You know? That was a kick. It was a kick in the ass on the part of people to say, hey, if you just sit around and not do anything hard or interesting, then this shit's going to keep happening and you're just going to be a victim of it. And by the way, the guys who are engineering that, they like doing it. So it's not even a matter of like pure stochastic. You got some serious assholes who are in charge of everything and they love drinking your milkshake. Well, some people said, all right, I'm going to play with this Bitcoin thing and think about how shitty it was back then. Like really, really shitty and hard and confusing and in some sense, obviously stupid. But the context was rough. Hey, we got fucked, worked over, and there's no possibility that's ever going to be rendered just. <laughs> no chance, right? Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, right? Two completely different subcultures perceiving exactly the same thing and both completely impotently expressing themselves into the world. Bitcoin? not impotent, actually did something. And people stepped into it and it got a little less shitty. And people stepped into it and it got a little less shitty. And every time it spirals out, right, it, face, it, it gets a little less shitty, a little more inclusive, a little easier to adopt, a little more obvious, a little more actual, a little more relevant to where you happen to be, which brings a slightly larger group of people in. Then it kind of breathes in and integrates and collapses in certain ways. It's organic, right? It's growing. And I mean, come on. <laughs> where it is now, yeah, that uh, it's going to go somewhere. It's going to be significant. The likelihood of it not being significant, from my point of view, is effectively zero. Right? Something big is going to result. I mean, something big has already resulted, but even much bigger. The question I have is um, more like, can it get lift off, and can it fly? Mm. I just like to to end with a sort of combining two questions that Rich sent over. Um, just, a, just a sort of sense of warning, or how do you avoid the pitfalls? Um, which is, firstly, what do you learn from the utopian optimism of Web One being defeated by the disappointment of Web Two? How do you prevent mm. it happening with Web Three? And v VCs, venture capitalists, throwing money around like crazy, won't they just enclose the commons and reiterate business as usual? <laughs> Let's work backwards. They should try. <laughs> they definitely will. So let's not assume that they won't try. Let's not, not, not be naive. Um, and and I'll, I'll go even further. Um, I think this this part right here is maybe maybe a good step. Let's not be be particularly naive about the reality of how that works. You know, the, the key insight is something like uh, the VC process is a train, not a boat or a car. Once you get on the VC train, you're on the VC train. You're going to go into the VC destination. Really hard to get off that train once you're on. Uh, what is it? You know, heroin not even once. VC funding not even once. Um, and and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quite pragmatic, actually. Uh, render into VC what is VCs. Render into Web3 what is Web3. And yeah, those big chunks of stuff, who gives a fuck? Like, I don't really care that much about Coinbase. It's a, it's a centralized exchange. Nice. Good. Useful. The fact that it goes public and almost certainly becomes evaporated is not that relevant. Right? It serves a purpose, but it lives and dies. Right? That's fine. Open C. Fine. Core stuff? No. You've got to keep the most fundamental aspects. I'm speaking here just directly to Web3, not to you. Keep the most fundamental aspects of this thing have to stay out of the clutches of VC. Uh, that's important. So that's the, the idea, right? Sort of be able to render into the periphery and allow the VCs to sort of play with and do their shenanigans, their mechanics. And by the way, raise the tides for everybody else. Like use that VC money, baby. Like allow it to come in and do experimental speculative things with actually some discipline and focus and intent to explore and build things up in the possibility space. But the important stuff, put it at the center, 
that has to be developed in the context of magic internet money. Right? Now, of course, DeFi, and by DeFi now, so I'm including the much larger field of all of cryptocurrency and all that environment, is there's a lot. Right? There's a lot of ways of being able to do the things that you otherwise might have used to need, uh, call it trash coins, which is a way of referring to fiat currency, um, to do. So you know, unlike Web2, you're, you're not addicted. Right? In Web2, your choices are like, Starving artists doing open source software are almost certainly going to get either acquired or, or uh, stolen or VC. Right? In Web3, it's, it's make a potentially shit ton of money in highly appreciating and future proof crypto tokens or, you know, have to surround yourself with, you know, this sort of obviously uh, septuagenarian and trash coin uh, VC universe. Right? It's a very different kind of trade off. So, I would do it that way. Notice I'm almost making an aesthetic choice. And it's like, uh, you think about early rock and roll or punk rock, where there was a pretty good level of, a, of, of sort of aesthetic sensibility uh, that selling out was a, a, a thing that you didn't do. And the challenge, of course, is the ability to choose not to. And the proposition is, hey, let's make more and more possibilities so that people can choose not to. And let's just take maximum advantage of what it looks like and convert the VC stuff into a perfectly proper piece of the larger story. Yeah. Great. Um, Was there anything that we didn't cover that you want to before we... We didn't do the first question. The first question. How do you avoid the naivete of, what do you call it, naive utopianism? Yeah. Let me think. I have to admit, I was... I was probably meaningfully part of that. So I'll just sort of remember being a naive utopian and I'm not a naive utopian. So what did that what happen there? Um, oh, this is helpful. This is actually very helpful. Uh, what, what Zach Stein calls intergenerational transmission, or we might just call wisdom. I would assume that uh, younger millennials, maybe even millennials in general, certainly most of Gen Z, are going to be relatively easy prey for naive utopianism or naive dystopianism because they're naive, <laughs> because they actually just haven't lived life in a rich, full way. And I don't mean that in any way disparaging. It's just the nature of what it means not to have circled the sun a whole bunch of times. Uh, we, who came in to Web 1, there were no elders. And it was just kind of us. It's weird, Cash, to realize that. Like, there, I don't know why. Why was that? I mean, other than the uh, sort of basic incorrigibility of boomers to have not ever become elders. So there's still no elders in Boomerver, Boomerverse. And I can tell you there weren't any back in the late 90s. Um, it's kind of weird. Right? It was literally just kind of us. Um, there were slightly older versions of us, but us. And the older versions of us, by the way, were cynical. So you had two vibes, right? You had kind of cynical and you had naive. And that was kind of it. And the naive utopians, eh, utopians a terrible word, but the kind of the, the, the naive projectors, what they what they what they will tend to do is they will fall upon their felt sense of what's possible, and then they will reify it as extremely almost certain, and by the way, relatively soon. I think if you actually have elders. If you actually have people who have, who can feel, who actually can perceive, like, yeah, yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about. I can feel the scene. I can, I know exactly what's, what's, what's speaking, you know, in your ear. And I've actually been through this thing. All right. I care for the same thing you care for. I want it to manifest in the world. And I'm, I'm interested in participating in the journey with you and stewarding that in a particular kind of way. And I'm not in the least bit cynical. But, you know, I've had my shit handed to me a bunch of times. So I know the difference between a naive utopianism, let's just use that term, and a kind of a realistic commitment to actually getting to the top of the mountain. Something like that. That might actually be really helpful. Like just an ordinary human thing of reasonably integrating the natural relationship between different kinds of humans, in this case, kind of the the relationship between different generations and cohorts. Um, 
I don't know how much wisdom there is in those who are available to participate in Web3. Here's something I would say to my own generation. Uh, stop being so fucking stupid and elitist. Like, if you have any clue, you know that Web3 is a thing. Like, whatever's causing you to sort of either poo-poo it or, or piss on it or not engage in it, I'm going to tell you right now, get over it. Bring your wisdom. And this, we don't really have a lot of opportunity to fuck around. And if you have wisdom to bring, bring that and precisely just that. Do not bring your trauma. Do not bring your cynicism. Right? Bring your wisdom and gift that wisdom into these people who are building and will live in the world that they're building. Perhaps with your children, if you're lucky. And so that's, that's the way I would say it. Like I would take responsibility. It has nothing to do with the kids. As if you're asking the question, it has to do with you. <laughs>